That's Enough Out of You podcast is sponsored by Todd John's Law. Unfortunately, bad things happen to good people, whether it's the result of an auto accident caused by the carelessness of another driver or being charged with a crime. Dealing with the aftermath of a personal injury accident or being involved with the criminal justice system can be extremely difficult. That's why, whatever you're facing, you should never go it alone. You need an experienced attorney who will stand by you every step of the way. Todd is experienced, licensed, trusted, respected, and guaranteed. No one will work harder or more diligently on your behalf, and he will personally handle your case from beginning to end. Located on Drinker Street in Dunmore, Pennsylvania, Todd has been representing the legal rights of Scranton and Wilkesbury personal injury victims and those accused of a crime for over 20 years. At Todd John's Law, the utmost priority is ensuring that your rights are always protected and that your case is resolved as quickly and fairly as possible so that you can move on with your life. Call Todd John's Law at 570-876-6903. With Todd John's Law, you will receive equal justice under the law. Hey, welcome to That's Enough Out of You. I am your host, Bill Rader. And alongside is my co-host, Sean Kane. Sean, what's going on? Billy Raids, how you doing, buddy? I'm doing good. I'm feeling good. It's a good, uh, nice weather out uh, for a fall Sunday here in Northeast Pennsylvania. Oh, so- I agree, Billy. It's, it's been a great weekend so far, buddy. You know, and it, it started yesterday early. Um, Nathan had, a, had an early baseball game, and he just had a terrific game. I know I sent you the video, Bill. He, he hit a bomb. And, you know, that, that was a high school field that they're playing at. And that that almost made it over the fence. I mean, it yeah. was a shot. Uh, the raw power he has for 13 years old, you know, but unbelievable. A great game he had. So I rewarded him, Billy. I took him for his favorite dish, calamari. Oh, nice. And, uh, I want to give a shout out to my buddy, uh, Vinny from Albania, uh, Primavera's restaurant in Scranton. You know, uh, took him there. And, and Vinny's is always great there. So anybody, you know, wants great Italian food, I mean, Vinny's, I, I know him for over 30 years, and uh, I know I sent some of our, our other listeners, like Gene Calagirio and, and Michael Pilch, and they go there out of time, Billy, but you got to get there, buddy, because uh, I love Italian food, and my favorite's like the North End of Boston, and, and Vinny's could fit right in there. He could fit right in there. His Italian food is just incredible. Yeah, I didn't even know it existed until you told me about it yesterday. So we'll definitely, definitely. Yeah, get down there, Billy. Yeah, for sure. Got everything: pizza, calamari, rigatoni, lasagna. All right, sounds good to me. I'm getting hungry already. (laughs) We're going to continue with this great weekend, Billy, because we got a tremendous, tremendous show today, and it's the request of our listeners. You know, we got so many questions. Uh, so let's get into it, Bill. Introduce yeah, it's guests. definitely definitely one of our one of our highest, uh, most viewed, and most listened to shows. We, a couple months a couple months ago, we had on David Whalen, who um, talked to us about the uh, his upcoming book and documentary um, on the assassination of John Lennon. And we welcome him back to the program, David. How are you today? Hi, guys. I'm very well. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming Thank back. You. We appreciate it. Yeah, it's probably. Yeah. One of, if not the most um, interactions, the most uh, feedback we've gotten from from our listeners is uh, the episode uh, with you. And Sean, I know you've compiled just a, a ton of, of, yeah. of, of responses, questions and comments and things like that. So I'm going to definitely hand it over to you, Sean. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm going to just going to hand it over to you and let you kind of go uh, and ask David all the, the questions that, that we've uh, that we've gotten. Yeah, so Dave, we got overwhelmed with the questions, buddy. I mean, it was it was the most feedback we ever got in an episode, and and it was just incredible. So I try to try to weave down to to what I felt was the most important ones, and you know, we got a lot of positive comments. I can't read all of them. We'll be here all day. So I just want to, yeah. But it, and we got some from from fellow authors too, but, uh, Dave. That that oh, impressed with your work. So that's that's tremendous. Oh, that's so I mean, I'm ready when you are, buddy. Yeah, I'm ready. You, yeah, we, we we haven't pre-done this, so I don't know what's coming. I'm, you know, please ask whatever you need to ask, guys, and uh, I'll be glad to try and answer them. All right. Okay, so the first one is from Matthew, and he actually has two questions. His first one is, 
I wondered if Dave Whelan has talked to radio DJ Andy Peebles, who interviewed John Lennon just two days before he died. Peebles might be able to provide some interesting details about what was going on in John's life around the time he was killed. Peebles has already noted that Lennon's bodyguards were missing on the night that John Lennon died. In 2015, he told Daily Mail that John and Yoko never went anywhere without their bodyguards. So Peebles was, uh, could not understand why they were missing on the night John died. Um, okay. What do you know about that, Dave? Well, first, first thing to say is uh, I have spoken to Andy Peebles. Um, just to give your listeners a bit of a background on Andy, he's a, he's a BBC DJ slash reporter journalist, I suppose. He was more of a DJ back in the day, a music guy. Um, he managed to get an interview with John and Yoko, I think it was about a week before the assassination. Uh, so he flew over with a team from London to, to talk to John and Yoko, spent two or three days in their company. Spent pretty much all day and night with them, went out for dinner with them, saw them in the morning. The interviews are a little bit round the mill, to be honest with you. He gave John and Yoko a fairly easy ride. But the one thing Andy said uh, was that, you know, every moment he was with John and Yoko, there were these two big, burly, uniformed guys in, in these kind of blue uniforms he described. Now, I had a very brief conversation with Andy. Uh, about a year ago now, he's. I think he's kind of tired of it all, to be honest with you. Um, he, he, he's, he's quite a prickly character. He's, you know, he's a nice guy. He spoke to me, but I think he's kind of, he's, he's had enough of the kind of constant harassing about this situation. He, he spoke to an author called Leslie, uh, what was her name now? I can't remember her name now, but basically a woman brought a, a John Lennon book out um, when did she bring it out? She brought it out about two years ago. And it, was, it, was, it sounded really good. I think it was called Who Killed John Lennon or something like that. And I thought, wow, this is going to be interesting. But it was just a kind of by-the-numbers biography of John Lennon. But what she did at the end, this, this author, she did a little interview with Andy. And Andy decided to kind of tell Leslie about this, these bodyguards that he saw. And uh, he just was really amazed when he got back to the UK and heard that John was killed the night before that, you know, where were those bodyguards that I saw the week previously? You know, why weren't they there? Um, here's what's interesting about those bodyguards, guys. One, we still don't know who they are. I've got a pretty good idea who they might be. They might be two New York cops. So I'm going to put details about who I think they are in the book. I can't be sure. But what's interesting is, what's really interesting is they, John and Yoko had a bodyguard called Doug McDougall. Yoko took care of all security. And Doug McDougall was hired sometime in early 1980. Um, and he basically criticized uh, Yoko for being too free with information regarding where they were and what they were doing. And Doug said, look, you know, you need to be a little bit more tight about information you give out about your movements because you're leaving yourself open. Um, Yoko, for Doug saying that, Yoko decided to put Doug on a leave of absence. And Doug, round about September time, was asked to sort of step down for a while. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Doug turns up the morning after the assassination. Now, that could be, that could be nothing. That could be just, you know, I've had this horrible event. My husband's been murdered. I need security. Doug, come back and protect me, which is what he did. He, he came back and brought some Pinkerton agents into the Dakota with machine guns, and Doug took care of all security from that point onwards. But it's kind of strange that he wasn't there that night, Doug. And it's kind of strange that there was these two other guys who were doing security the week before that, who nobody really knows about. So there's a guy called Fred Seaman, guys. Are you aware of Fred Seaman? No, I don't, no. I don't believe so, Dave. No. Yeah, Fred, Fred Seaman, is a, he was an assistant who worked for the Lennons. Uh, he wrote a book about John and Yoko called um, The Last Days of John Lennon. He's, he's had some legal problems with Yoko, so he's, he's, his kind of opinions are slightly coloured because of that. But he said he saw a diary entry uh, before the assassination that said that um, Doug McDougall was due to come back to work for the Lennons on the 9th of December, which is the day after the assassination, which seems to kind of premeditated, that's when I'm going to need it. And Fred thought that was very suspicious. But of course, there's no proof of that. That's just Fred saying that, that he saw that in the diary. So we're not quite sure whether Yoko planned for uh, Doug to come back on the 9th 
uh, as a kind of slightly suspicious premeditated act or whether she just rang out, uh, you know, reached out to her bodyguard after the murder and said, you know, please come back to the coach and protect me. So it, it's kind of open for debate. But what's interesting is Doug McDougall was ex-FBI. He was an ex-FBI agent, a pretty serious one by all accounts. So you have to kind of ask yourself, what was Yoko doing hiring an ex-FBI agent when you consider how much the agency right. caused so much trouble for her husband? You know, it's, it's well documented through a fantastic book called um, Give Me Some Truth, the John Lennon FBI Files by John Wiener. Uh, John did a lot of FOIs and he got a lot of FBI files released. And they were tracking John and Yoko for many, many years. Um, so you have to sort of ask yourself, why Yoko, why this guy? Now, according to another Lennon Dakota insider, a guy called Michael Medeiros, who was working there as well as Fred Seaman. Michael says that she hired this guy because she wanted to kind of get an inside track on what the FBI were thinking and doing with regards to her husband. Okay. Now, we don't quite know how much of an inside track she got off this guy, but Doug McDougall was a very interesting character. He didn't last long after the murder. He was kind of fired. She let him go the following year. I think he got as far as the spring 1981 and Doug McDougall allegedly took his eye off Sean in Central Park for a little while and Sean kind of got missing for a few minutes and then, you know, they found him and she said, now, why weren't you keeping an eye on him? And Doug kind of threw off the handle and said, right, I'm, I quit. And she said, okay, quit. Um, and then what happened to Doug from that point onwards is he, he got some John and Yoko materials, tapes and things like that and letters and things that he said he was going to hold on to until he got some, inverted commas, back pay. <laughs> so what happened was Elliot Mintz, their publicist, went over to see Doug, no doubt with a very strong NDA and a large amount of cash, and paid Doug for all these materials to get back off Doug, gave him his back pay, inverted commas, no doubt got him to sign the NDA, and that's the last the world ever heard of Doug McDougall. So just to get back, it's quite a long-winded answer to your question about the Andy Peebles bodyguards. Uh, the answer is we don't know who these two guys were, but they definitely were there for sure. Andy said to me, you know, they were constantly in the presence of these two, of John and Yoko at the time. Um, it's just weird that she got rid of her regular ex-FBI bodyguard, hired two unknown bodyguards, and neither the two bodyguards that we don't know about or Doug McDougall working on the night of the murder. So it's all very strange and some would say slightly suspicious. Well, well, Dave, what's suspicious to me about that is is when you study all these assassinations, I mean, this is a, a common theme with them, right. is you see the security um, is lax before the assassination. You see that in the John F. Kennedy assassination. You know, the military intelligence unit was called off that was supposed to supplement the Secret Service. The security oh. is, is downplayed. And, and you see that in all these cases. So that's extremely suspicious to me that these two bodyguards were were not there at the time and they they were with him constantly except on the night he was killed. Right. And that, that's point. One, that's one thing we've we've learned, you know, Dave, is that there's there's no such thing as as a coincidence. Um, you know, <laughs> if, sure. if he was scheduled to to come back the day after the assassination, that's that should tell you something right there. Um and yeah. Dave, real quick, the, the the author you were you were trying to think of, Leslie Ann Jones, I believe is the that's name. That's it. That's it. That's Google, it. Thank Google's you for that. A wonderful Bill. Yeah. Thing. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah, she's great. She's a, and again, like Andy, she's an ex DJ, uh, worked in London radio for a while. It's, it's a good book. It's an okay book. It's kind of led and by the numbers biography. Um, but that, that bit with Andy revealed to her at the end of the book, I thought was the most interesting, interesting part of it. Cool. All right. Well, the second part of Matthew's question, uh, Dave. Concerns mm. uh, May Brussels, and I don't know if you guys are familiar with with oh, May Brussels. Sure. And okay, for so sure. just to 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 let everybody know, um, this is going to tie into an episode we're going to have shortly. Um, we got somebody from the May Brussels uh, Research Library that's helping to digitize all her work. Um, she's hey. going to come on our show. So I've been doing a lot of research on May Brussels and and listen to a lot of her her episodes on her on a radio show. And um, I'm going to have a comment after this question, but here, here's this question, Dave, and this, this is a great one. This is part two of Matthews. Um, right. Second, I wondered if Dave Willen has had looked into the claim that John Lennon was in contact with the renowned pioneering conspiracy research radio host, May Brussels, shortly before she was killed. The author, Alex Constantine, who knew Brussels personally, 
mentioned this in an interview in 2014 and said he thought that this contact with such a controversial figure might have been one of the reasons for Lennon's murder. Now, Dave, I could tell you from from listening to a lot of these episodes on May Brussels, she had a relationship with John Lennon. She knew John and Yoko. She talked about them on a radio show. Uh, she was friendly with them. Uh, she respected John Lennon, um, and they they went out on several occasions, um, families together, get-togethers and stuff. Um, but the thing is, if if May Brussels was in contact with John Lennon, say the months prior to the to the assassination, and she was telling Lennon about all this the information she had on the assassinations of the sixties, which was was tremendous research on her part, mm, and sure. Lennon was planning to say. And I'm, I'm just speculating here. Lennon was planning planning to come out and and say a lot of May Brussels research. I mean, there's your motive for a murder because think about this: May Brussels is on is, is a tremendous researcher, but she's kind of on the fringe radio where Lennon has mm-hmm. that reach of international. I mean, you could reach millions and millions of people. And if he came out with the information that May Brussels had collected over the years, that is a tremendous motive for for murder. And I just wonder, have you, Dave? Uh, do you have any information that the last few months of his life that Lennon was talking to May Brussels about these conspiracies in the sixties? Do you have any information on that? There's no documentation on, on, on their visits and their meetings. Uh, I have heard that they met and I'm fairly certain she did know John, John, John never publicly said he knew May or he spoke to May or he admired May. Um, but I think from the May camp, there's definitely talk that they they had a relationship and in the last year of John's life they were quite close and they met up a few times John John was a seeker for sure uh he certainly had things to say about the Martin Luther King assassination and you can be well aware that he had been keeping an eye on things like JFK and RFK and Malcolm X and you know he was he was into those kind of causes especially when it comes to the civil rights movement so I, I think he would have been very interested in May's work I think there is a connection there I'm not sure John taking May mainstream would have been a reason to take him out. I think it might have been a factor. So I think there might be lots of factors uh, that came to came to a head with regards to the decision to take John out, and May, might, you know, him knowing May Brussel may be one of those. Okay. But as far as documentation and as far as proof that they kind of had a meeting and there were other people there that can kind of, you know, say that definitely happened. That none exists as far as I know. But boy, would I love to. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I'd love to get that kind of proof, and I'd love to get to sort of some idea of what they talked about, and and what they, you know, what they both thought about each other's ideas, because they were very much kindred spirits. You know, yeah, as I exactly. said, John was John was a, John was a seeker. He was constantly looking for information, had a very open mind, uh, and he would have loved May's work for sure, hundred percent. All right, fair enough. Yeah, and we'll look into that. We'll ask, you know, when we have our guest on on May Brussels, we'll oh, ask yeah. about that more, and we'll see what we can find out. But Please that, do. that's just really hit the rest of the stuff because uh, she mm, was really sure. unbelievable her research was oh, tremendous force of nature force of nature she was, she was a head she's a pioneer she was, ahead of she time. was. and you got to remember too she's doing this at a time where you know most of the conspirators are still you know they're still alive it's it's you know one thing to talk about this stuff 50 60 years after the fact when most of the conspirators are dead she was she yeah. was doing this when they were alive and in power dangerous dangerous yes. times very brave woman a very yes. interesting woman. There, there, there needs to be a mainstream book about May Brussels or a documentary or something. It's, it's just waiting to happen. Oh, I She's agree. She's been fringed, fringed for too long. Too long. And of course, just quickly before we get off May, she's the woman who inspired Fenton Bresler, remember, to write his book in the 80s, Who Killed right. John Lennon. So we've got a lot to thank May for. Absolutely. Mm. All right. So the next question, Dave, is from a fellow author and uh, you know friend of our show here, uh, Lisa Peace. <laughs> Good old Lisa. Yeah, she's she's a big fan of your work, and uh, she's uh, actually the likewise. one that, that got us together, Dave. She's the one that reached out to me about you. Um, she's great. I love Lisa. You know, early on in my investigation, I reached out to her, asked her some questions. She was just so gracious with her time. Yeah, she's wonderful. Absolutely. And of course, her book on RFK is the definitive the work. So, yeah, brilliant. So here's what she said. She said, uh, "Sean, please ask Dave about the use of Bernard Diamond on the defense team." And in my book, I talk about how Diamond wrote articles saying uh, hypnotized witnesses should not be allowed in court, yet he hypnotized Chapman, I think. This is what I want to know about 
that's what I gathered from what Dave has written previously and said on your show. Mm. Yeah, Diamond was part of a gang of hypnotists uh, slash psych- psychologists uh, who were hired by the defense team to go in and unlock, as they called it, Mark Chapman's mind and figure out what was going on in there. I think the way they did it, they kind of, what was really amazing about it, guys, is is Jonathan Marks, Mark Chapman's second defense lawyer, who may have been a private lawyer, may have been a public lawyer, it's still open for debate whether he was paid or not, but he was certainly well out of his depth with regards to taking on one of the biggest crimes of the century. But that's another question and that's another theme. But what's interesting is when Jonathan put these experts in there, and Bernard was one of them, Bernard Diamond, who, of course, was you know, in Siren Siren's cell, uh, and Milton Klein, who was a CIA consultant, he actually went to the media uh, on, I think it was the 12th of December. It was very, very, very soon after the murder. In fact, I have the paper right in front of me. Let me just see now. So it was on the, yeah, 12th of December. And Jonathan Marks basically declared to the world via the New York Post with a front page headline, killer to be hypnotized, then an assassin to act out murder. Um, And what's really interesting about that is why do you need to get a guy who says he's done something, he's admitted it, he's at the scene, he's been charged with murder. Why do you need to unlock his mind? What's what's left to unlock, Right. if you think about it? Um, So it's very strange that these guys are going in there. First... People like Bernard and Milton Klein were very interested in the cha- in the capture and the rye uh, kind of element to the murder. And they were very much, if you listen to the tapes and listen to the tr- transcripts of the ones that they released, because remember what happened with, well, when these guys went in, Bernard Diamond, Milton Klein and others from the defence team and the prosecution team, but let's talk about the defence team guys, they pressed tape record and they, they, they basically recorded audio of their discussions. Uh, but they had complete free reign, complete free access. There was no monitoring. There was no independent person sitting there watching what they were doing, watching what they were saying. So you basically had guys with well-renowned hypnotist skills going into Mark Chapman's cell and closing the door. And they had him all to themselves. They could press play and record if they wanted to, or they could just press stop. So we never quite knew what they were doing with him. The, the, the official line was, we're trying to unlock his mind to figure out why he killed John Lennon. But of course, Mark Chapman already declared that in the in the days after the murder, he said, "I killed John Lennon because I went to Mark Catcher in the right." And for the first few weeks after the murder, that was all he was doing. He was just talking about, "I want to promote Catcher in the Rye. I am the Catcher. It's the greatest book of all time. This is my mission in life." Um, and what's interesting is Bernard Diamond and Milton Klein, the two most nefarious hypnotists that were put in there by the defense team, they were very keen to promote that idea initially. They were kind of almost egging Mark on, saying, oh yeah, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna make this book a bestseller. There's gonna be a Hollywood film about it, Mark. And you're the guy who, you know, has kind of made this book gonna be the greatest book of all time. And they were kind of making it almost like a kind of religious mission they was on to sell this book. But what's interesting is after a while, around about kind of March, April time, when the Hinckley, uh, Ronald Reagan assassination happened, it all got a little bit tricky with Catcher in the Rye because obviously there was a connection there to another assassination because the book was found in John Hinckley's hotel room. And from that point on, you can see a very clear um, decision made by the experts with hypnotism skills, Bernard Diamond being one of them, to move away from Catcher and move away from that being the obsession and the reason why Mark felt compelled, to use his word, to kill John Lennon to a more, you've been possessed by demons and you've been taken over by demons and the devil made you do it. And to a more kind of, more kind of straightforward, mundane, religious angle. Right. Um, so it's it's interesting, but Bernard Diamond's fascinating for, for two reasons. One, obviously you've got that Siren Siren connection that he was put in there to mess around with Siren, Siren's mind. But it's also, he's, he's very much a kind of blank page really. He was, he studied at the University of California and we know, or he's a professor there, and we know that's where a lot of MK Ultra stuff was going on. So there is a link there. But he's unlike Milton Klein, who came out and declared on a TV documentary that he was a CIA consultant for MK Ultra. Bernard Diamond's kept very much in the shadows. 
but um, I, I think one day, like Jolly West got 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 kind of fingered by by Tom O'Neill for chaos, and Milton Klein is a self-confessed CIA guy. I think eventually, hopefully, we'll get official documentation that Bernard Diamond was a CIA asset, and I'm almost convinced he is. It's just it's, it's just right. too many coincidences. He, he shows up in too many nefarious assassinations to not be connected somehow. Absolutely. But we never really know. We, unfortunately, we don't really know why. He was put in there with Klein. Well, well, I think we do. What we don't know is, is what they said. Everything they said was it was up to them to declare what was going on in that cell. And my book will explain more of this, but I think the reason why they were all in there eventually was to get Mark Chapman to plead guilty, which is what they did. Uh, it was absolutely crucial that that uh, murder didn't go to trial because if it did, Mark Chapman would have got off 100%. There's just... just <laughs> <laughs> there's so much doubt it's just and Dave, that's a it, pattern it, that's a pattern in these cases you see that with you know with ruby I, with with sirhan sirhan you know with james l ray i mean you know they want to control the narrative control the defense team get these guys you got it. these guys to to plead guilty and then the evidence doesn't come out you got it you got it if there was a trial i mean from all the things that i've discovered in the last three years there's no way chapman would have been convicted no way. Right. Even even with a even with a ridiculous lawyer by his side, you know, overwhelming doubt. You know he he didn't do it, and it would have come out. The the, the, the wounds would have come out. The the entrance and exit entrance and exit wounds yeah. the, the problems would have come out. The forensic problems would have come out. The background of Chapman and who was around with him and what they were getting him to do. It's uh, it's just no chance, no chance. And he you can say the prosecuted. same thing about Oswald and Sirhan Sirhan and, and James L. Ray. I mean, it's you know. None of them would have been convicted. But we've actually got, I mean, again, my book will reveal this, but there's, we were told Mark Chapman pled guilty because uh, God whispered in his ear. Right. It's, it's a little bit more complicated than that. It, it was a little, there's, it's not just as simple as God told me to plead guilty. There, there's actually a very specific type of religious calling, let's put it that way, that, that came into Mark's ear. And that very particular thing came from Milton Klein. And only Milton Klein. So Milton Klein was the guy, I think, who succeeded in getting Mark to think that some celestial higher power wanted him to plead guilty. And it was, it's clearly, there's a clear trail from what Milton Klein was saying to Mark Chapman and what Mark Chapman said to his lawyer about wanting to plead guilty that makes it absolutely certain that Milton Klein engineered that outcome, which is just incredible. But but so obvious, of course he did. That's why he was sent in there. Fascinating, Dave. Mm. Um, so let's move on to the next question, Dave. Um, so this is from Scott Hopkins, and he said, um, uh, "Did Chapman really have a hit list, and was that really real?" Okay, good question. Um, the hit list first came to prominence from Officer Spiro from the 20th Precinct, who was the first officer on the scene to arrest Mark Chapman uh, with his partner, Peter Cullen. So they took him back to the station and Stephen Spiro built up a bit of a rapport with Mark. And they Mark sort of said that he kind of trusted Stephen and went to be near Stephen all the time. Stephen is a very interesting character because Stephen, the night of the murder, he said to his partner, Peter Cullen, I think something big's going to happen tonight, which is a bit strange. And then after they arrested Chapman, they were starting to drive him back to the station. He said, I told you, I knew something big was going to happen tonight. So that's a bit odd. But then Spiro built up a bit of a relationship with Chapman when he was in prison. He started to send Mark Chapman some letters telling him that he was in the paper doing this and doing that, which is very odd behaviour. And Chapman sent him some letters back. So Spiro is a man of great interest, and I'll reveal more about him in my book. But Spiro is the guy who first came out to the media about two weeks after the murder and said he had a kind of hit list. A few names are on it. Then you've got Alan Sullivan, the, uh, the head of the Manhattan DA District Attorney's Office, who was the chief prosecutor for, um, for the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. And he said, no, 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 he didn't, he didn't have a hit list. There was, there was no hit list. He had a few names knocking around in his head, but no real hit list. But then a few weeks later, it was announced that, yes, there was a hit list. And there were some names on it. And the reason why I think the DA's office needed this hit list is that their kind of prosecution line was Mark was a cold, calculated killer who wanted to kill for fame. It was really important that they had to sort of, they had to, you know, if, if he didn't get Lennon, he would have got someone else. He'd have shot 
the president or whoever. Um, so they kind of had to kind of go with it. And once they went with it, they couldn't go back. So this, this hit list became quite mythical. Um, so when I managed to access lead detective Ron Hoffman's notebooks, I, uh, I, I, I kind of was delighted, absolutely delighted to find a copy of what's called the hit list. And I'm just going to pull it up now on my computer screen so I can read it to you so I don't make sure I get any names wrong. But it, it's kind of the first thing I can say to you guys is it, it looks like it was written by an eight-year-old uh, is the first thing I can say. Because what's interesting is it's it's kind of at the top of the list, it just says hit list. <laughs> and then it's underlined, <laughs> uh, which is like something an eight-year-old would do. Right. Uh, and then and then you've got you've got six names: John Lennon, Walter Cronkite, Johnny Carson, George C. Scott, Jackie Kennedy, Anastas is crossed out, so he's just left Jackie Kennedy, and Marlon Brando. So you've got those names, you've got those six names. But what's interesting is in the years after the murder, many more names started to be added to it. So we started to hear things like Paul McCartney was on there and Elizabeth Taylor was on there. And it just got silly. It got to the point where there was just like 15, 20 names that were just constantly thrown into the mix that Chapman was going to go after. Now, Chapman has never said he had a hit list. So he's never kind of gone out and go, oh, yeah, if I didn't get Lennon, you know, I'd have got someone else. You know, Chapman was a very confused guy in the night of the murder. So I don't know why I did it. I had nothing against Lennon. Don't know why I was standing there. Don't know what happened to the gun. So he's not saying, oh, yeah, I had a hit list and Lennon was the first one at the top of the list. If I didn't get him, I'd get someone else. So I think the hit list was invented. And what's really interesting is throughout Chapman's paroles, they bring it up now and again. Sometimes they don't bother to talk about it, but sometimes they do. Around right about sort of 2010, 2012, 2014, it comes up the hit list and they ask Mark to kind of talk about it. And he's kind of going, oh, yeah, you know, I think I had a hit list. Yeah, yeah. Elizabeth Taylor was on there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But Elizabeth Taylor wasn't on the hit list. <laughs> so Mark, Mark is, or the so-called hit list that's in Detective Hoffman's papers. So Mark is actually playing along with the deception right. because he's kind of, they've told him so many times, you had a hit list, Mark. Right. And Elizabeth Taylor was on it. He's gone, oh, yeah, yeah, I think Elizabeth Taylor. He's got no idea. Yeah. No idea what was on that hit list because he never wrote it. Um, there's no proof Mark Chapman wrote it. There is a copy of this hit list, which I've just described to you in Detective Von Hoffman's paperwork. But nobody, Stephen Spiro, the DA's office, nobody can say definitively when Mark wrote it. It certainly wasn't on his possessions when he was arrested because that was listed. He had some cash. He had a wallet. Uh, I think he had a receipt for a gun, as you do if you're a cold calculated killer. You have a receipt for your gun in your back pocket, right. don't you? you know, which leads back to the shop you bought it. Why wouldn't you do that? Just to yeah. make the cops make the cops' job just as easy as possible. Yeah. Uh, but it, but it, but he didn't have a hit list. So where did it come from? Did they find it down the back of a sofa in his hotel room? Again, I've got the hotel room inventories. There's nothing. It doesn't say hit list. There's all kinds of things that Mark Chapman had in his hotel room but there's no hit list. So where, where do they find it? In a drawer? In his mum's back bedroom? <laughs> I, just, I just don't know. Um, so I think it was invented. Um, okay. And I think it's, I think it's nefarious. And um, it's interesting, Kim Hogreff, the assistant DA prosecutor, often goes on uh, documentaries over the years. You've seen him, I'm sure you've seen him, guys. Mm -hmm. he, he makes yeah. sure he gets on every documentary. And he co constantly brings it up. Oh yeah, he was so such a cold, horrible, calculating killer. And he was so desperate for fame. He had a hit list and he'd take out anybody on that list. You know, he just, he couldn't, he didn't care who he was going to kill. But then of course they, they don't realize that when they say that they're actually counter, countering what they previously said, that he was a John Lennon Beatles fanatic who killed John Lennon because he was obsessed with John Lennon. So wh which one is it? Is he, is he a John Lennon obsessive or has he got a hit list and doesn't care who he kills? He just wants to be famous. So it, it just, for me, the hit list beautifully illustrates how nonsensical the prosecution case was and how desperate they were to kind of, and I'm not saying the prosecution made this hit list up. God knows where it came from. It could have come from just some cop having a joke. I don't know. It, but it's just kind of materialized. It was certainly in Detective Hoffman's materials. It was in his paperwork. So he had a copy. So someone gave him a copy. Uh, but who that was, where it came from, I don't know. But I'm almost certain Mark Chapman didn't write a hit list. 
All right. Fair enough. Yeah, it's, it sounds like one of those things, David, that, you know, Chapman probably heard it so many times and probably was told so many times that he had one, that he, and he believed it. Exactly. Even if and that's didn't... happened a lot. That's happened yeah. a lot, Bill. Yeah. So many times yeah. his parole, he comes out with stuff and you just think, Mark, that's not true. And you're just saying it. Because what's interesting about his paroles is I've spoken to friends of, who know him and are in contact with him in prison. He's desperate to get out. Desperate. Right. Yeah. Uh, that's not that's not the um that's not the narrative. The narrative is he knows what he did, he's done and he's you know, he's he's happy to be atonement, you know, atoning in prison and he doesn't want to get out. And I don't think he should get out, by the way, because I don't think it'll last very long if he did. Right. But um but he is desperate to get out. So he'll say whatever he's told to say. Yeah. <laughs> he he'll go along with whatever invention they want to throw in front of him to and, and, try and get that result. Yeah. And, and Dave, you know, if I mean if you look if you see video of some of these interrogations, it, it's really it's the same thing. You know, they 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 keep uh keep these suspects in, in custody, you know, in a tiny room for hours and hours and hours. They 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 don't let them go to the bathroom, they don't give them food, you know, and they, they're constantly barraging them with why did you do this? Why did you do this? What you know, to the point where they they say, you know, all right, I'll admit to it if you just let me, you know, let me out of here. Like just and, and I think that over a period of time, it sounds like that's that's what happened with, with Chapman. Exactly. I mean, a little little plug here, guys. If, if your listeners go to my Substack, David Wheeler.substack, um, I've put an article up there about the hit list and I've actually posted the, the hit list on there. You can see it for yourself hmm. and see if you see if you think that was written by an eight year old or yeah. or a cold calculated killer or maybe right. someone else who was trying to invent a legend of a killer who was desperate to kill for fame, which is what I think, it, which is why I think it was invented, to be honest with you. Right. But there you go. Fascinating. Right. It's a fascinating sidebar. It's, it's certainly something that everyone talks about all the time. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's a bit of a distraction, to be honest with you. But it, it did its job. A lot of people think, oh, yeah, I had a list, and Lenin was the top of the list, and he would have gone for who's second on the list. Uh, Walter Cronkite, Johnny Carson, George C. Scott, Marlon Brando. It's, they're just so random. But of course, right. in 1980, these were very famous people. Of course, they were. I mean, this was, yeah, it wasn't, he wasn't aiming low. These were the most famous people in the world <laughs> at that time. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I don't, I, I think it's nonsense, but you know, it, it did its job right. for sure. All right. So next question, Dave, now you can answer as much as you want to on this. I don't know if you want to leave this for your book, but. Okay. Uh, this is from uh, Giordano from Rome, Italy. Um, he said, as far as the last episode when you were on with Sean and Bill, Dave, could you go mm. into a little bit more detail in the Nixon, Reagan, Bush angle being behind the assassination? So I don't know how much you want to go into that, Dave. Or, um, or yeah, okay. Or... Yeah, I, I will leave some for the book. What I will say, I'll leave a lot for the book, actually. I will say there is a connection to Nixon. Uh, a very strong connection. There's a person uh, who's connected to Nixon who I think was, well, I know was connected to people around Mark Chapman. So that, that disturbs me. Um, I think if, if, you, if you look at who would really like John to go at that point, I, I think the two people that I would put at the top of the list would be Richard Nixon and, and Ronald Reagan. Uh, for what Richard Nixon had to go through with regards to John Lennon, and, they, you know, he really had to go through a lot. John really made it his mission to make Richard Nixon's life as uncomfortable as possible. And I think John was unwise to go to the Watergate hearings with Yoko and sit in the audience and watch watch Nixon, you know, <laughs> un unfurl in front of him. Um, I think that was, you shouldn't be poking a bear like Richard Nixon, who was a, a very paranoid, uh, dangerous guy, as far as I'm concerned. With regards to Reagan... Oh, yeah. Uh, they were. They did know each other. They were. They were. I wouldn't say they were best friends, but they were fairly close. Um, and Reagan, of course, was coming in with a very hawkish, military-friendly agenda. And if you look at Ronald Reagan's misadventures with Iran Contra and Central America, right? Uh, you think, well, if you knew that was on your slate, and you knew someone like John Lennon did this to the previous Republican president what's he going to do to me how's he you know who's who's the guy that can maybe swing an election you know if, if after the first four years of of my presidency if i do do all these things that we know he did and maybe he was planning it as early as 1980 even earlier right. probably 
um, what would John Lennon do? He could get hundreds of thousands of people out of rallies, young people, you know, to, to protest against what Reagan was doing. Um, so it was very beneficial for Reagan that John Lennon died when he did. It was, it's, it, it's, you just can't get away from the timing that Reagan got it in November. He, he looked a shoe in in the summer. August, it was kind of a done deal. You know, Carter was a lame duck at that point. And so you, you kind of, that's when Chapman was triggered, as far as I'm concerned. He was triggered in August, September, 1980, at the very point when Reagan was definite to get in. Um, and I just think, you know, I'm not saying that Ronald Reagan, you know, gave the, gave the go ahead for a hit. I'm not saying Richard Nixon did. But for me, I always see these kind of things a little bit like, um, you know, Thomas Beckett, you know, that very famous medieval story where Henry II has this kind of battle and this schism with, with the, with the uh, you know, his, his main bishop, Thomas Beckett. And they kind of had these lots of arguments about religion and the, the role of kings and the roles of the archbishop. And, you know, is it religious power? Is it monarchical power? And, and there's very famously, um, Henry II says, who will rid me of this tiresome priest? In, you know, in, in earshot of some rather handy, aggressive, violent knights who then go off to, to murder. Thomas Beckett, you know, in, in his church, very famously. And I think it could be something like that. I, I think people within the Reagan-Nixon nexus might have known of Richard Nixon's hatred of John and might have known that Ronald Reagan had an agenda that was going to be very much in John Lennon's sights. And I think, you know, they, they might have gone off book. I'm sure they did, actually. I don't think it was an official thing. And just got people in that they know could do a job and, uh, and, 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 you know, get rid of a, a very prominent vocal critic who may have swung an election mm -hmm. the next time Reagan tried to get in. So it was just for me too convenient. The timing was too, too prescient. It was too disturbing that the, that the time John went was just before Reagan got in and Reagan was doing stuff that John would have absolutely despised. So there, there is a link. I will, show, I will show links in my book. I will show people that were connected to, to Nixon. Um, and we'll see. We'll see what people what people make of it. Of course, there's no paperwork. These things are always done off the book. Sure. But I think if you if you look at if you look at the connections, and there are direct connections back to Nixon, mm -hmm. to people who were involved in Chapman's life, um, I think people will make up their own mind from that. Yeah. And, and you know, if you don't think that there are. <laughs> assassinations of uh, non-political figures that are politically motivated, um, I would invite you to listen to, to, to our show. Um, <laughs> Two of your shows, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, you know, there's, there, uh, there's, there's going to be a lot of, and, and I can't wait for, honestly, I can't wait for for the book and the documentary if it's come out. Thank you. Um, but I, you know, in fact, that, that reminds me, we haven't even mentioned the name of it yet. Um, and we did the same thing last time. Go, oh, go yeah. Ahead. Well, the book, yeah, the book, the book should be out by, by, by the anniversary, John's anniversary. So it's very close now. So it'll be out before December the 8th. So I, it's, it's very soon. It's coming. It was initially going to be, it was, it's always going to be called the assassinated John Lennon, but we had a subtitle where we we're going to call it, give you some truth. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem with that is there is actually another book, an FBI files bit, which I mentioned earlier, called "Give Me Some Truth." So it's actually now going to be called "Mind Games: The Assassination of John Lennon." So oh, okay. oh. Um, that, that 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 will be coming out. We just think "Mind Games" for reasons you'll know when you read the book is yeah. far more appropriate uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> for what yeah. went on uh, with regards to the March Shaman and that assassination. So the book's definitely coming out. I've written it. I'm very proud of it. It's it's going through the final kind of legal uh, process. Uh, you can imagine there are a lot of legal. Um, things to uh to be careful about in this kind of thing so we're kind of we're being very careful what we say and, and who we talk about and how we talk about them and we're trying to be as open as we can uh and try and give everyone all the information they need and, we, and what we're doing is we're just saying some look this is all the info you don't know and there's a lot people don't know and we're going to say you make up your own mind what you think went down that night but one thing i can absolutely be certain about is my book will prove that what we told what we were told happened did not happen Mm -hmm. uh, and from that point onwards, we'll let people make up their own mind about what really happened that night. With regards, you know, to, with regards to the documentary, we're hoping that will come out sometime next year. Yeah. And so. you know, 
David, what, what's interesting, um, I, I, a lot of people that I've spoken to when I mentioned, you know, that we had you on and, and kind of told them about the, the topic and everything. Yeah. I, I, I usually, I expect the reaction to be, Oh, you know, that's just another conspiracy or that's wild or whatever. The reaction I'm getting is, you know, I always thought that there was something, something about that. There was something that just didn't sit, sit well with me about mm -hmm. that assassinate. It was just too tidy. It was just too, you know, too wrapped up. And, and I, I hear this from a lot of people. It's so oh, interesting. It's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, that is interesting. I mean, if you think about it, just from a kind of basic level, when have you ever known such a famous crime to happen? And, and the guy that allegedly committed that crime just stood at the scene and said, yeah, I did it. Come and get me. Right. When has that ever happened? No. Even when you got a patsy like Oswald, you, you kind of got on the move. Sure. <laughs> it's, you know, it's kind of like you got the bus. He went home. He got out of that, book, you know, book depositories building fairly fast. I think he said something was going down. But Chapman was just a docile idiot, just standing there reading a book, going, "Yeah, I did it, but right. I kind of, I kind of don't know why I did it. Yeah. Don't know what happened to my gun. Don't remember him actually falling over. Don't really remember the bullets hitting him. Don't really remember pulling the trigger. But you know, I think I did it. <laughs> it's just, it's just ridiculous. Crazy. 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 Absolutely yep. ridiculous. Yep. Well, there you go. Okay. All right. So what's next, guys? Next one is from another fellow author, uh, David, and a friend of our show, uh, Rick Otto. And he says, okay. um, Sean and Bill, just listen to your episode with Dave Whelan. Um, the similarities between JFK and RFK assassinations are remarkable. Established narrative with Lenin and the above murders are um, completely contradicted, if not eviscerated, by the medical evidence. I cannot mm. wait for Dave's book. This right. his research is tremendous. So that's a that's a big uh, you know. That's great to hear. Shout out from yeah. Ricardo. He's a really good that's author, right. Dave. He is. I'm very proud to hear that. That's great. But there is a lot of similarities, especially um, with the R with the RFK assassination. There's so many tie-ins that just it's just so similar. You know, we already talked about Diamond and just the way it, the way it happened. There's a lot of similarities mm. and. Uh, you know, and I look at it just as an Intel op. That's how I look at this. And, and I see, uh, you know, I could see it. I could see it developing. Yeah. Did, did you want me to sort of talk about what, what sort of comparisons there were between between the two? Is that is that is that the question? Um, well, he was making a comment uh, about it. But yeah, sure. If you want to you want to go into that uh, specifically with uh, Sirhan Sirhan, that'd be great. Well, I mean, if you think about it with regards to JFK and RFK, and in fact, MLK and John Lennon, they, they were all people who promoted peace. So let's just let's just start there. Right. Uh, I think George, George Carlin did a fantastic sketch yeah. about assassinations where he talks about everyone who's been taken out. And they all, you know, the one thing they had in common was they wanted to promote peace. And right. they all ended up with a bullet. Um, and also with regards to RFK and JFK, there's, there's a really important point to make here. Uh, you know, we were told that these people were shot, you know, in a different place to where they were actually shot. So obviously right. JFK, we were told, was shot at the back. Well, you know, he was shot in the front. Anyone who's seen the Bruder film can see that for themselves. It's fairly clear. Right. With regards to RFK, we were told he was shot in the front, but we know from the autopsy that he was shot in the back, uh, yeah. in the back of the head, behind the ear. Uh, Lisa Pease, of course, will give you all the information you need there, guys, so please go yeah. get a book. And with regards to John Lennon, we were told quite clearly by Mark Chapman himself, the NYPD, the DA's office, and all the media at the time, that he was shot in the back. He was shot in the front, so it's it's just remarkable. They they can't get that entrance and exit thing right, um, and it it kind of gives it away because obviously all three of those murders had a patsy who were who were positioned in a particular place, and for the you know for the patsy narrative to work, the bullets have to go in from where the patsy can achieve it. So of course, if you figure out that the bullets went in another way, the patsy was a patsy. And the real killer was elsewhere, doing the business and putting in the entrance in, entrance bullets in, in a different place. So that you know that that to me is what started this whole adventure. Once I found out from the doctors and nurses, who remember were professional people, guys. These these are not kind of like junior doctors or junior nurses or these, these were died in the wall New York, nineteen eighty doctors and nurses in an ER room who saw gunshot wounds, possibly daily, 
at that time. New York was a very dangerous place, guys, in the 70s. So <laughs> by the time John Lennon was assassinated, Dr. Halloran and nurses Cameron Sato, they knew how to, you know, assess a gunshot wound. They really did. They, they knew their stuff. These are highly professional people, experienced people. And all three of them say quite unequivocally, they've got no doubt in their minds. And they remembered it at the time. They remember it now. John Lennon was shot four times in his upper left chest with three bullets coming out of his upper left back in a direct line of fire. One bullet stayed in, the one that was nearest his upper left shoulder. And remember, you know, the nurses saw those wounds three times. Once when they were operating on John right. on the, in the ER room and twice when they washed and, and wrapped him twice. So, you know, you, you just can't get away from that similarity with RFK and JFK. Uh, other similarities we could talk about, we could talk about, obviously, we talked about earlier, you know, Siren Siren and Bernard Diamond turning up in two famous assassinations. We could talk about the fact that, that the uh, investigation by the LAPD and the NYPD for RFK and uh, John Lennon were just ridiculous and, 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 and very poorly conducted. In fact, I, I would state now that the John Lennon investigation didn't even happen. I don't think a proper investigation right. happened. Um, so that's that. Same Which with JFK, the Dallas. It is remarkable. I mean, you know, we all know from our JFK research that the Dallas police were a joke at the time, yeah, uh, and weren't absolutely. doing a very good job. And 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 there were other people there. You know, there were agents on the ground picking bullets right. up. This has been well, you know, yeah. well noted at the time. Medical records, good old medical records. Very important that they go. Uh, we know with JFK and RFK, there's problems with the medical records, and of course with John Lennon on the night of the murder, Doctor Halloran made out a ER report with a stick drawing, front and back stick drawing of a man. He put the four entrance wounds on the front, he put the three on the back, and that night, that ER report went missing. Never been seen again. How convenient. How convenient. And then we've got, if you want to go into even MLK, look at James Earl Ray. You know, a, a petty thief of low intelligence, Let's, let's be honest. Uh, I think, yeah. you know, I don't think James Earl Ray would even, you know, contest that when he was alive. Who managed to fly all around the world um, after, after the Martin Luther King assassination? Right. He ended, I think they caught him in Heathrow in London, didn't they? They yeah. did, yeah. And he's using fake yeah. IDs and, you know, they just, yeah. How, how, did, how did he pull that off? And then you've got Mark Chapman, a janitor, flying off all around the world. Mm -hmm. How do you get the funds for that, Mark? Where, where's the money coming from? You know, it's a very famous saying. It always works for me. Follow the money. Right. Where'd the cash, where'd the cash come from, Mark? You know, his mum was, she kind of was, she was divorced. They weren't rich. The family weren't rich. Where'd the cash come from? You know, maybe, maybe the money came from, as we're told, the, the, the Castle Memorial uh, Psychiatric Hospital apparently gave it to Mark as a loan, we've been told. Why would they do that? How do they know he was even going to come back? Never alone pay them back. So, you know, there, there are so many parallels, guys. Um, and, of course, there's that, there's that fantastic one with regards to, you know, Lee Harvey Oswald and, and Mark Chapman. They both decided to leave their gun at the scene with, with allegedly their prints on. Now, we don't even know if there were prints taken on Mark Chapman's gun. That's, I, I actually mentioned to the lead detective about prints. I said, did you get any prints on the Chapman gun? He, he couldn't remember. We've certainly never been... It's, there's been no clarification on that, that they took prints. Because remember, guys, when the police turned up, Mark Chapman didn't have a gun on him. The gun was somehow found on the ground. Somehow it got from his hand to the ground. Mark doesn't remember how it got on the ground, by the way. He just knows. It. I think he said in his statement to the police on the, at the night, I think it was sh shook out of my hand by the doorman. But he's not certain. Mark can't remember whether he dropped it or it was shaken out of his hand. What we then have been told is that the doorman kicked the gun Right. to the back of the driveway, didn't pick it up himself, which you'd think he would do. And also kicking a gun is a very dangerous thing to do, wouldn't you say, on a cobble sure. sort of driveway? Absolutely. He kicks it anyway. A loaded gun he can go it. off, absolutely. It, it could. So he, so he kicks it. He kicks it to the back of the driveway. And then he doesn't then just go up to it and pick it up and take it into the building, which you'd expect him to do. Because remember, at this point, Mark Chapman is docile reading a book. Okay? <laughs> he's just, he's not a, really a threat. And, you know, Jose Paderma was a big guy, bull of a man, in fact. But he waits. He waits for someone that he doesn't even know might come. Luckily, someone does come. The, the lift operator, Joseph Manny, comes up in a lift with two co-workers. 
And apparently Jose Paderno says, quick, grab this gun. And apparently he kicks it to him again. He's almost playing, playing soccer with this gun. Kicks the gun over to Joseph Manny again. They've all said that he kicked it to them when they got up there. So this is probably a, a second kick of a gun from Padermo to, to Joseph Manny. And Padermo says, take that and go and hide it in a drawer. So Joe Manny picks it up, takes it downstairs with his two co-workers. So we know that happened because there's two witnesses there. So it's three guys. It's very hard to get three guys to lie. So I think that definitely happened. But the gun that Padermo kicked to them when they came up, how do we know that was Chapman's gun? Right. How do we know that's the gun that was used to put four bullets in John Lennon's chest? We don't know. We know, we do know, there's two different bullets that were found in John's body. So, you know, and Dave, that that's going to tie into a couple of questions we have coming up. Okay. Well, well I'll stop there, guys. I'm, 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 yeah, I'm, no, I'm, that's good. Uh, but it's it, it. it really a good tie in because the, the, the next couple of questions that we have, uh, this one is from, from Angelo Mariucci. Um, he said, what I don't get is why kick the gun and have someone pick it up and then hide it in the basement. Also, if the doorman picks up the gun, his prints are now on it. If he was involved in something in the past, you would assume that it would come up if the prints were to be run in an investigation. Um, Question, yeah. Good point. Yeah. Very good point. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, he made sure, Padermo, that he wasn't going to pick that gun up. Right. Uh, he, had, he had two opportunities to do it. Yeah, the opportunity when it was allegedly at the ground in, in front of Mark Chapman's feet and he kicked it to the back of the driveway, allegedly. Uh, and then he had another chance to pick it up when he was at the back of the driveway. Remember when Joe Manny and these two co-workers, Joe Gresick and Victor Cruz, came up, they said they saw Padermo. They all said this, and I've got their statements, walking around the gun in an agitated state. So, again, it's like, why didn't you pick that up, Jose? Right. <laughs> you know, why? Why didn't you pick it up and take it indoors? But he was desperate not to get his prints on it. So, yeah, that's very right. suspicious. Very that's, suspicious. That's, that's, a, that's, that's a very suspicious mark against Jose Padermo, for sure. And, of, and of course, a court of law, any, any decent lawyer would say, well, how do we know that was Mark Chapman's gun? Mark doesn't remember pulling the trigger. Mark doesn't remember aiming. Mark doesn't know how his alleged gun was at his feet and then was kicked to the back of the driveway. None of this Mark can actually clearly remember. So... Mm -hmm. No court would go with that. I mean, the, the, the chain of custody was broken multiple times, multiple times. We do know a Rodolfo Blake, Officer Rodolfo Blake, arrived at the scene after many cops were already there, went down to the basement, and we know he came back up with the gun wrapped in newspaper. Real top work there. <laughs> Real top police work going on there. Right. And... Uh, <laughs> And we know that, according to Ron Hoffman, the detective who I've spoken to many times, he said they found five empty shells. We've got no proof. There's no, we'll never see these empty shells. But what's really interesting is when I asked Ron, well, how many you know, spent bullets did you find at the scene? You'd expect to find five, um, though there should be three, because remember, two were found at the autopsy. We got, we got the morgue report where there was two bullets that were found, uh, one in John and one in his leather jacket. So there's three bullets missing. Where are they? There's no inventory, there's no voucher for them. Ron Hoffman can't remember whether they were found. What we do know is, though, that the two bullets that came off the morgue report, one was a hollow bullet and one was a non-hollow bullet. So why is the cold, calculated Mark Chapman who used hollow bullets, often said by Kim, Kim Hogreff in the DA's office and the NYPD, you know, he used hollow bullets. One of them wasn't hollow. So is he just a really poor... You know, did he did he just kind of get a handful of bullets and didn't know how to, you know, identify a bullet? Or did he just get unlucky and one non-hollow got put in a hollow batch? Or was there something else going on? Very bizarre. And it now, just David, doesn't add up. And again, sorry, sorry, go, go ahead, Bill. No, go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, again, a court of law would just say, what the hell's this? Right, right, which is, which is why it would behoove them, you know, not to have a trial. Um, yeah, exactly. So now you did mention earlier that there was a receipt for the gun that, that was found on uh, on Chapman. Yes. Did you tie him yes. to the gun? Uh, well, yeah, the guy is from JNS Enterprises in Hawaii. Uh, it was for the a, a point thirty eight special uh, charter arms. Um, and, and, and I'll be honest with you, the gun that I've seen, I've seen the photography of the gun and I've seen the gun receipt that the NYPD put together a, a kind of evidence voucher. The serial number on the, on the receipt and the serial number on the gun and the serial number um, on the voucher 
are all the same. So they do all match up. So that gun was bought in Hawaii. Uh, and that gun, I think Mark Chapman probably did have on him that night, to be honest, because it does all match up. And the guy who sold him the gun identified Mark when news reporters went to talk to him. He, he certainly wasn't wasn't interviewed by the NYPD or the A's office, but there there is some video footage that I've seen, which I'll probably put on my YouTube channel, actually, where the guy is interviewed. He said, yeah, I remember him coming in. I sold him the gun. So what? I still got him every day. But, you know, he didn't he didn't ID him in a in a in a lineup. Or anything like that. He just remembered this guy on TV looked a bit like the guy who bought the gun. Right. Whether it was our Mark Chapman or whether it was another Mark Chapman, because of course there is evidence there was another Mark Chapman in New York a few days before the murder who was going around doing crazy things, a la Lee Harvey Oswald. No, right. Just like Oswald, yeah. Exactly. Just like Oswald. Um, you know, it could be it could be another Mark who went into that shop and bought that bought that point thirty eight special in Hawaii. Who knows? Who knows? So Dave, the next questions we got are, are another tie-in. I'm going to read them back to back because they're they're about Jose Paderma. Um, okay. This one is from uh, Dan Hankey. He said, "Oh my God, what an episode you guys had with Dave Whelan. That was a grand slam. I'm convinced it was a plot. Now, good clarification on Jose Paderma. I would like to hear more on his background. If he's a CIA asset, regardless, incredible information. Now." There's another comment I want to read before before you answer this, uh, Dave. This is from mm. a, a researcher by the name of Joel Jackson, and you know I I got back and forth with this guy. Sometimes his information I I I don't agree with it, and sometimes he's got some stuff I I do agree with. So I've always had a back and forth with him, but he has this here, and I don't know if you looked into this, but here's what he said. He said, from my research, Jose Paderma, his real name was Jose Joaquin. Saginus? I don't know if I pronounced San Gen- it. San Genus. San Genus. And he said yeah. he was a chief of Operation 40. And when JFK was shot, 35 members of Operation 40 were in Dallas. In 1974, fearing the Watergate link to JFK assassination would, would unravel, Saginus faked his death in Florida and later turned up in New York as Paderma, the doorman at the Dakotas, when Lennon was shot. Okay. I mean, what what do you know about that about the Saginus? Okay, deep breath. <laughs> this is going to be a long answer, but okay. I'll try and make it short. Okay, so the the San Genus Operation Forty CIA Padermo is a very important part of the story that's been completely uh, misunderstood, and, and I think deliberately. I think it was a red herring that was put into the public conscience back in 1987 by a journalist called Jim Gange. And I think, I don't think Jim, you know, did it deliberately, but what he did was once he, once he threw that name out there, uh, the world put two and two together. And I'll tell you how it happened. Basically the doorman, Jose Padermo, let's call him Dakota Jose Padermo. Uh, the night after the murder, he disappeared. Okay. He wouldn't work the door anymore. The Dakota, he went to work downstairs in the basement. He refused to work the door anymore. Uh, maybe traumatized, maybe he was getting old at that point, he had problems with his legs, but he, he made sure he didn't get himself on camera. So I, I, just because I'm saying that Operation 40 CIA Bay of Pigs Padermo is not Dakota Padermo, doesn't mean that Dakota Padermo is not nefarious because he did some very strange things like kick the gun, which we talked about earlier. But the, the reason why this is all, uh, this confusion has been uh, left to kind of reign on, especially online for the last 20, 30 years, is what happened was after the murder, Jose Paderma, not only did he go down in the basement of the Dakota, he kind of went down in the dark basement with regards to the story because nobody got a chance to interview him and his name was never released. He was always known uh, by the media as the doorman. So that for some reason, they were desperate to keep his name under wraps, which is very suspicious because, what well, they got to hide. You know, he apparently did nothing. He kicked the gun, so what? But for some reason, his name was kept under wraps. So we only got to find out about his name uh, seven years later in 1987 when Jim Gaines, Jim Gaines is a very prominent professional journalist who got into Mark Chapman's cell in the mid 80s and did loads of interviews with him and basically did three magazine articles for People magazine in 1987. Very popular magazine articles. And in one of those articles, Jim Gaines mentions for the first time that the doorman at the Dakota was called Jose Padermo. But then he adds a little bit more fuel to the fire. He says that Padermo and Chapman spoke about the JFK assassination thing, the Bay of Pigs, 
acting. And this doorman was called Jose Padermo, and he was an ex-Cuban anti-Castro guy. So everyone's like going, okay, we kind of got the measure of this guy. He's kind of ex-Cuban. He was talking about the Bay of Pigs. Hmm, let me let me do some research on this guy. Now, if you do some research on Jose Padermo and Bay of Pigs, you find a guy called Jose Sanginas Padermo, who was at the Bay of Pigs, and he was a CIA operative, and he was a very serious individual because Operation 40 slash Brigade 2506 was a group of mercenaries hired by the CIA to go in after the Bay of Pigs and mop up. And these guys were basically assassins for hire. After the Bay of Pigs collapsed and was a joke, and we all know what happened there, a lot of this group were kind of hired further on to do off the books work. Let's, let's, let's put it that way for the CIA and various other nefarious uh, agencies before you would even know about. So the guy that ran this group, the guy who was in charge of this group was called Jose Sanginis Padermo. So you can only imagine that a guy who was in charge of a group of assassins, uh, ex, ex uh, Cuban, uh, you know, guys who probably were before Castro came in, probably worked for the mob. Um, some of them did, I'm sure. Uh, though apparently Sanginis was a, 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 a secret police agent, a secret police officer for the Batista um, regime before Castro came in. So again, he would have been a rather nasty individual doing that kind of work. So we know there are two Padermos, but what happened was people fused them together. So they said, okay, if this guy's talking about the Bay of Pigs and Mark Chapman, and there is a Bay of Pigs operator with the same name, they must be the same guy. And I have to be honest with you guys, when I first started to do the research on this three years ago, I, I kind of went along with it. I went, well, yeah, maybe it is the same guy. But then when you start to talk to people at the Dakota who knew Dakota Jose Padermo, and you start to sort of dig into who he was and where he came from and when he started working at the Dakota, and then you start to dig into who Jose Sanginas Padermo was, you realize they were two different people. Now we have a picture of Dakota Jose, and he's a kind of you know big, stocky guy with white hair. I think in the kind of late 70s, early 80s, he's looking like a guy who's kind of in his 40s, possibly 50s. Um, he's not an old guy, but here's the problem. Jose Sanginas, Operation 40 Bay of Pigs, uh, Jose Sanginas Padermo, was born around about 1912. And according to John uh, Frank Sturgis, the Watergate burglar who worked with him uh, in his CIA days, he died in 1973. So in 1912, if, if you've got a picture of 1912 Jose Sanginas Padermo taken outside the, the, uh, the Dakota, and we know we've got a couple of pictures now of Dakota Jose Padermo, um, he would have been around about kind of, well, what would it have been, 1912, so let's say 1980. So we're talking late 60s, early 70s. The guy in the picture is not that old. Right. But you've also, you've also got another problem because we know now, I've, I've found out that Dakota Jose was born much earlier, uh, much later, sorry. So the, the, the records don't add up. So if you kind of, if you think at the end of the day, you know, what I discovered about Dakota Jose was he, he basically, he left Cuba round about, well, f first, thing, first thing you need to know is he was born in 1934, okay? So he wasn't born in 1912. So he was born 22 years later, okay? And he died in Florida in 2010. We know this for a fact. Um, so when the photos were taken outside the Dakota that we've got of Dakota Jose Padova, you've got two of them. He was supposed to be round about kind of 43. And that does add up. He does look, look like a 43-year-old man. We know he left, Dakota Jose left Cuba round about 65, which kind of makes sense. A lot of people did. Uh, you know, he spent a few years under Castro, didn't like it, decided to leave, came to New York. But here's here's the real crunch, guys. Here's why we know they're two different people. Dakota Jose, when he came back, when he came over from Cuba, did some menial work for a few years. But I know for a fact by people who've been at the Dakota and got these records that he started to work at the Dakota in 1969. OK, now here's the really important fact here, guys. John Lennon didn't actually come to America till 1971. OK. And at that point, we didn't know he was going to live at the Dakota. He didn't turn up at the Dakota until 1973. OK. So how the hell, if Dakota Jose Padermo was Bayer Pigs Jose Padermo, CIA asset waiting for John Lennon to come along 10 years later so he can be part of the plot to kill him, how could he foresee the future? How could he foresee in 69 that he was going to kind of be there to help with the plot? Now, of course, right. it could be a happy accident. It could be a happy accident. You know, maybe. In 69, 
Operation 40 CIA assassin decides to go and work the door at the Dakota. And then, oh, wow, four years later, John turns up. No, oh, maybe in seven years' time, I could be part of a plot to kill him. This is, none of this makes sense. And, what, and if you think about it, guys, if, if you look into Bayer Pig's Jose Paderma, he really was a very nasty, serious individual. Is a guy like that going to want to work the door of the Dakota for 11 years before John Lennon's assassinated? Is a guy like that going to want to go and, you know, open the car doors for people and, you know, stand in the booth all day? Yeah, I don't think so. Dave, a couple of things to add there. Uh, Operation 40, I mean, I've done a lot of research on that. Two two names yeah. that are very familiar with Operation 40 that that's interesting would be Richard Nixon and George Bush because, yes. you know, Richard Nixon was was Eisenhower's vice president. And he he was heavily involved with Operation 40 and well aware of this. Yes. And oh, the yeah. same thing with George Bush, who had a long connection to the CIA uh, prior to becoming director. And we know, of course, his father, Pr Prescott, had a... Uh, you know, connection with creating the CIA. Um, and, and the other thing, as far as you, you mentioned uh, that the, the Jose Paderma could have been a red herring. I mean, that's, that's so familiar to me because there's so many of these, these things. When you look at these Intel ops that you see these, these rabbit holes that are left for people to go down, like the, the tramps in, in the Kennedy assassination or stuff, stuff like that, where researchers go down these, these rabbit holes and they're stuck there forever. You know, so I don't think, you know, the name Paderma, I mean, that's that's not an accident. I think, you know, that could definitely be, you know, red herring. It's a common you know, name. You're, you're dead right, Sean. And it's, and it's a common name, you know, Paderma. Jose Paderma, if you look in Cuba at the time, there were hundreds of Jose Padermos. This, this is this is not a weird name in, in Cuba. Um, and if you look on the, the Cuban uh, exiles website, you know, where Jose Sanginas Paderma is, is, is listed, we know he's, we, from there we can get his birth date. Which is really important. Um, there's, there's there's four or five Padermos there that were that were at the Bear Pigs. So one of them could be Dakota Jose Padermo potentially. But at the end of the day, I, I just you know you talk to the guys who knew him. What, what's interesting about Dakota Jose though? There are questions. Obviously, his his actions on the night were very strange, and they weren't. They were, I think, quite suspicious. But he was given the job by a brother. Uh, his brother gave him the job, and his brother is no one can remember the brother. So everyone I talked to is like, I was way before my time, but oh, did he have a, yeah, we know a brother got him the job and the brother was working there before Jose was working there. So I'd like to know more about the brother, but trying to get records out of Dakota is very difficult. So that, that's, that's, a, that's a person of great interest to me, the brother. I'd like to know more about him. Was he potentially, uh, I can't believe there'd be two brothers both called Jose Padermo, but it'll be interesting to know who that guy is. And what's interesting about Dakota Jose is when he left, working there um, in the 90s, um, I think it was 94 he left, he stayed in the basement for maybe 13, 14 years. His two sons went to work at the Dakota uh, for many years. So it was very much a family affair, the Padermos at the Dakota. But I'm 95% I'm certain that Dakota Jose Padermo is not Bayer Pigs, Op 40, Jose Padermo. And it's such a shame because it is a delicious link, you know, with obviously Op 40 being Absolutely. Under, the per under the purview of Richard Nixon, you know, having a CIA assassin on site, uh, you know, when Mark Chapman is being played out as a patsy. It it's, it's just, I can see why people got excited about it. And I got excited about it. I, I bought into it initially. But when you actually start talking to people who knew Dakota Jose, and when you start checking on the records and when they were born and when they died and, and, and you know who exactly they were, they're, they're two different people. I'm, I'm almost certain of that. But what is really interesting, just one last little caveat on that. We were told by John uh, Frank Sturgis, who we know is one of the world's greatest liars. Yeah, he's a great at disinformation. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. That's part of his purview, no doubt, in oh, CIA. Yeah. But he, he said uh, in, a, in a book that um, his friend's uh, Op 40 Padermo died in 1973, right? And he died, you know, in secret and his family weren't at the funeral, which is all very suspicious, but okay, Frank said it, maybe it's true. And the guy was born in 1912. So, you know, maybe, maybe he died 61 years of age, a bit young, but we'll go with it. But what's interesting is in 1989, there was a commander at the Bay of Pigs died. I uh, forget the guy's name there, Roman Pepe or something like that. I can't remember the guy's name now. But the uh, there was a newspaper obituary for this guy. I think it might have been the LA Times in 1989. 
And they got a quote from one of his colleagues at the Bay of Pigs, a so-called Jose Padermo, who said that this commander was a great guy. And he loved, he loved, you know, fighting alongside him. So I thought, wow. who's that Jose Padermo? Wow. Who's that? I thought Bay of Pigs, Jose Padermo died in 73. Right. But this guy turns up for a quote in 89. Unbelievable. So, yeah, there's, I'd love to see a picture of San Genis, Jose Padermo, but there's, there's none so far that's been verified as him. Lots of people put pictures of the guy up and they say, oh, it's, this is definitely him. Or this, again, disinformation. I've seen four or five pictures now that people say, oh, if you go on various websites, there's pictures of this Jose Padermo, Dakota Jose Padermo. And Dakota they're just not, Padermo, they're not him. There's, there's nothing in his background that you could link. Um, well, he to left, to right well, he left Cuba in the mid '60s. Okay, so that's a bit suspicious. I mean, right. he, kind of, he clearly, he clearly, he didn't, he wasn't apparently, according to people who knew him, he wasn't particularly political. But why did you leave Cuba then? Obviously, right. you had a problem with Castro. Otherwise, you'd have stayed there and mm -hmm. you know helped, you know, help the revolution. So he clearly wasn't a Castro fan. Otherwise, why immigrate? So. But whether, you know, apparently genial guy, liked a cigarette, quite, quite sort of attractive, apparently. You know, he liked to sort of, you know, chit chat with the ladies out on the sidewalk, quite charismatic, very poor English, uh, which is a problem because when he, and again, this is another, let me, while we're on Padermo, this is another really interesting point. On the night of the murder, Padermo wasn't working the door for a while because leading up to the murder, or well, leading up, let's call it what it is, leading up to the assassination, in the months leading up to the assassination, Padermo had bad legs and he was working in the back office, working in the concierge's back office. Uh, but the problem was the concierge, Jay Hastings, was doubling up doing the door for Jose, who couldn't stand very well. And jo Joe Manny, the lift operator, was also doubling up doing the doorman work while Jose was recovering in the back office. But according to Joseph Manny and Jay Hastings, the concierge, they both have confirmed that Jose had really bad English really bad English and what was a, the problem was his English was so poor that when the phone rang in the concierge's office he couldn't actually deal with the requests and he couldn't deal with the conversation so they had to go indoors and deal with the phone conversations for back office Jose Padermo with a poor English so the first question you got to ask why did the Dakota put up with this is a very interesting question but here, here's the real suspicious thing on the night of the murder Although, this, again, I keep saying that. On the night of the assassination, um, Padermo was in the back office as usual. And I think Hastings and, uh, well, the day before, let's say, Padermo was in the back office. And Hastings and Joe Manny were doubling up on the front. But apparently on the day of the murder, uh, the 8th of December, Monday night, it was a, a, apparently a very um, unseasonably warm December night. And according to Joe Manny and Jay Hastings, Padermo said to them on that day, do you know what? It's a lovely evening. I think I want to go out and work the door tonight. For some reason, his bad legs didn't, they weren't a problem for him anymore that night. And he decided that he wanted to go out and take in the warm air. But he hadn't done that for many weeks, possibly months prior to the assassination. But that night, Dakota Jose Padermo asked to work the door. And he went out. He worked the door that night and he was the guy that was there when Mark Chapman was doing what Mark Chapman was allegedly doing. And then the, the night, the day after the murder or the assassination, Jose Padermo never worked the door again. So to me, that's very, very suspicious. Yeah. He made sure that he was out there that night. Mm. Made yeah. sure of it. So there we go. It's yeah, Jose, he's complicated. Very I've got a lot of questions. A lot of questions I'd like to ask him if he was alive, but he died in 2010. Uh, the family are kind of, they've had enough. They're tired of all the accusations. Mm -hmm. uh, apparently that the brothers, when they were working, his two sons that were working the door uh, in the kind of late 90s, early 2000s, often used to get approached by people talking about their dad and they used to get very upset about it and angry about you know the accusations against their dad. So they've kind of, they, they're not really up for talking much about it. Um, and, and, you know, their dad wasn't op 40 cia Padermo, i'm sure of that but he's still a very suspicious character he did some very suspicious things leading up to the murder and after the murder so there's there's more there's more questions to be asked for sure absolutely i told, I told you it'd be a long answer guys no that was great dave <laughs> that was great i mean fantastic um next question's from uh scott alfieri 
who's a who's a really good researcher, and uh, we had him on recently talking about the Rockefellers. Um, he, he says, uh, great episode on John Lennon with Dave Whelan. I, I knew next to nothing about this uh, before, but I still don't get why it occurred in 1980 and not 1970. I get Nixon hated Lennon, but what was going on in the six months before or after could be the key to the whole thing. Maybe the assassination was for distraction purposes. And uh, um, Dave, maybe, you know, when you think yeah. about the Hinckley, um, you know, attempt on Reagan, which is coming up, that that's very suspicious. And, um, you know, when we talked about, you know, May Brussels, if, if she was talking to Lennon before, that could be a key. I mean, there's a lot of different things there to unpack. I think it's a really good, I think you make a good point, Sean. I, I, I don't think it has to be one particular thing. I think it right. can be a kind of, a, I think it can be a build up of lots of different factors where different agencies, different people with different interests who are all connected say, do you know what? It would be quite handy if this guy's not around anymore. And it, it doesn't have to be just the CIA or the FBI or, or whoever, you know, it, it, or, or, or some dark nefarious group we don't know about. It, it, I, for me, from the research that I've sort of, uh, you know, been doing for the last three years, it's lots of different disparate elements that I think all came together at the same time. Uh, and, and what they've all got in common is they all despise John Lennon for what he stood for. Because remember, John Lennon was anti-war for sure. You know, this is a guy who nailed his peace colours to the mast very early in the early seventies. But right. you're right; by by nineteen eighty, he wasn't he wasn't doing peace beddings anymore. He wasn't he wasn't you know putting out singles like "Give Peace a Chance" anymore. He was putting out you know sugary pop songs in nineteen eighty. So he, he wasn't really a threat from his music. Um, but I think it, it, for me, it doesn't have to be. Um, logical in many ways with regards to the timing. It doesn't always have to sort of fit like clockwork. Oh, Lennon was going to go and do this, so they had to take him out before he could do this. I, I think he was unquestionably getting active musically in the summer mm. of 1980. Uh, I think the May Brussels thing is interesting because obviously if he was having secret meetings with May Brussels or, or not so secret meetings with May Brussels, that would, I mean, everyone knew at that point who May Brussels was and what she was about right. and what she knew. Uh, and obviously, this is pre-internet days, so someone like May Brussels could get a lot of traction uh, pre-podcast days. So, I mean, mm -hmm. all, all her work was kind of radio and underground kind right. of publication stuff. So it was hard. So someone like John Lennon would have just taken her and put her work on steroids and just got Absolutely. it out there, as you say, right. in the mainstream. So I think that is, that's definitely something that needs to be researched more. Mm -hmm. um, but I think with regards to why 1980 and why not 1970, which is a great question, I think you just, again, we, what we were talking about earlier, I, I think you can't get away from the fact that Reagan was coming in. And Reagan, you know, it's, it's astonishing. I, I, there's a chapter in my book called Life After Lennon, Ronald Reagan. And uh, what that guy got up to is just staggering. Right. Absolutely staggering. You know, the, the, the blood on that man's hands, which is interesting because I don't know if you guys have noticed, but the last sort of five, 10 years, there's been a kind of reinvention of Ron. It's yeah. kind of like, oh, he's this kind of folksy oh, yeah. homestead yeah. guy, you know, who kind of, he was a really nice guy, you know, and he kind of, he really cared about people when he's, he loved Nancy <laughs> and, you know, wasn't he, wasn't he a great actor and, you know, right. ev everyone loved the Dutch, lovely old Dutch. But when you actually research what his administration did, and I don't think Ron Blessing knew much about it, to be honest with you. I think he was very much a front man. He was, he was doing what he always did. He was acting. Sure. Um, but, but the people behind him, the military misadventures and the corruption in that government is right. just staggering. Absolutely staggering. I, I mean, people don't realize how bad Iran-Contra was, how bad that scandal was. I mean, you know, like all you of said, it. a lot of those people like Bush and Cheney and Rumsfeld and those guys behind all there. Reagan. I mean, all there. you know, I think Bush was running the country, not Reagan. For sure. For sure. And, and I think, you know, it could be a dry run. It could have been a dry run for Hinckley. Uh, and what happened there? Obviously, there's connections. You know, we know Milton Klein, CIA, MK Ultra turned out in Mark Chapman's cell. We know Jolie West, good old Jolie West from you know your previous episode on you know Chaos. He yep. turned up in Hinckley's cell. So, you know, there's connections there, and, and I yeah, think Ruby. Hinckley has all. Yeah, Ruby's Hinckley had all the hallmarks of an MK Ultra hit. Sure, mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, and of course, he had yeah, a, the family had a connection to the Bush family, which I they mean, did. They, hard they to get did. past that. It is hard to get past it. So I think when you link it, and obviously there's a lot of things that my book will reveal about people that I think were behind it. And, and there's, there's, there's certain groups that I think will surprise people. 
Uh, but when you, when you actually see them all together and when they're all linked up together and you see all the connections that they have to each other, you think, oh, okay, yeah, I can, I can see a network here of people who would absolutely detest John Lennon for his anti-war stance, for his anti-capitalism stance, uh, anti-religion stance. Let's not get away from that. You know, John was a constant thorn yeah. Yeah. Uh, in the in the kind of fundamental Christian community, uh, Southern community, especially where they had so much trouble after his, you know, we're bigger than Jesus quote in the mid 60s. So he had a lot of powerful enemies, John. He made a lot. He was very reckless, really. If You know, if I was if I was John's agent, I, I really would have said, look, you know, you just need to be a little bit more thoughtful about who you're antagonizing here. And who you're poking, you don't. You know, he didn't need to be at the Watergate hearings, gloating. Why? Why'd you do that? Well, you don't have to constantly berate Christianity. That was, you know, we know you're not in. That was John. Sorry. I mean, that's that's what made him who he was. I think that's that's what contributed to his, you know, some would say genius is the fact. And that appeal, he, yeah, you're right. You know, and and the, and also, I think one, you know, one of the things that I would say you know, to John, if I was his agent or his publicist or his manager is be careful when dealing with yeah. the public, because you, you don't, there are nuts out there. There are a lot of, and, but he didn't care. He was, he was a guy who, you know, if you, if you've ever seen that classic footage of him bringing that, that guy, the, the, um, the Vietnam vet, the Vietnam vet into his home and, and feeding. Mm. Him. I mean, he, you know, this guy could have showed up with a knife or a gun and, and, you know, got, done God knows what, but John didn't care. And, and I think that's, again, it's what made him, it's what contributed to his genius, to his artistic abilities and, and his, his view of the world. Yeah. And, and, and his appeal, Bill, I, I think people, right, you sure. know, fake politicians have been around a long time. They're not just a, a thing of today. And I think people like someone who just spoke you know, straight from the hip. And what one word that kept coming up with John, and I, I've spoken to a lot of people who knew him back in the Beatles days, and the word that just keeps on coming up is reckless. He was just, and, and, and it was, that was something that he, he enjoyed being reckless. He got a thrill out of being reckless. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and that was part of who he was. Uh, it's that kind of rebel, really, that, that was very much ingrained. And he liked taking risks and um, he liked living on the edge. Um, but he also, I think he, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, at the end of the day, how, how can anyone foresee what happened to him? You know, he kind of, and, and at the end of the day, he wasn't taking care of his security. That was Yoko. So, and again, that was a, a failure of him, really. You know, he should have, all right, Yoko, up until the murder was kind of hiring bodyguards and letting bodyguards go and putting bodyguards on leave of absence and all kinds of things. But she was doing some kind of security. But why didn't John get involved in that? You know, why just, what's, what's going on with the bodyguards? You know, again, um, I. I don't think it was in his, it was in his nature. He didn't, it, it didn't even phase him. You know, he didn't mind interacting with the public. He didn't mind people coming up to him and, and, you know, talking to him and shaking his head. I don't know. I mean, it's just. Yeah. And there's something that, there's something that Gil Scott Heron said at the time, which I thought was quite, quite interesting. He, he sort of said that it, it was a kind of very much a kind of mean spirited, nasty assassination because conservatism had kind of won. You know, the Republicans were kind sure. of coming in. Right. They didn't need to take him out. They were kind of in charge. Yeah. But I think what Gil Scott Heron didn't really understand is John, the, the power in the seven, in the early 70s, especially where John could go out and, you know, do a rally for all kinds of causes like John Sinclair and doing rallies for kind of Irish Republicanism, and all the, which would have put him on the, by the way, the, the British intelligence radar for sure. MI5 has still got a lot of files on John Lennon that they're not releasing. So I don't think this has to be an exclusively an American deal. Um, but, but, you know, John, when he was doing those rallies, he could get out an awful lot of people and he could get an awful lot of press attention. So, you know, very, very quickly in 1981, if he lived, you know, when Reagan starts to do what Reagan started to do, John would have been out there protesting for sure. It's an absolute guarantee he would have been. Um, and to silence him, was it a dry run for, for the 81 Reagan? Possibly. But I don't think it was. I think it was just a kind of like, well, we know he's back and he's active. We know Ron's kind of a shoe in for the presidency. We know what Ron's agenda is. We know what we know what our agenda is with regards to Central America and the Middle East. Um, we'll get rid of this critic sooner rather than later. Uh, because we want to, you know, this this is a two-term project. 
we, you know, we don't just want four years. Right. We want eight. Right. And, you know, if, if we do a lot of bad things in the first four years, which, boy, did they do that, John could swing it. Yeah. But we don't get the next four years. Well, and, they, and they ended so, up with 12, ultimately. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. You know, and, and all the seeds of what we've got today maybe was sown there. I don't know. It's a bigger question than we can answer here. But Absolutely. But, you know, I mean, I mean, what we do know is, guys, you know this from your show, in, in the 60s, 70s, in, in the 50s, 60s and 70s, we know that foreign tunes were just part, part of the course. So, you know, to, to up, you know, to Allende, to whoever, you know, they, 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 they just hire someone locally to take someone out or they'd engineer a coup or they'd engineer a revolution or they'd just literally just blow up a plane if they have to. You know, they do whatever it takes to take out a critic of, of policy. So do you think the people that can do that have got a problem taking out John Lennon? I don't think so. No. I don't think so. No, I agree. At the end no, of the day, it's just, no. it's just business. It's just right. business. You know, sure. this is a critic. This that's guy's going to get in the way of what we're doing. Let's just, just take him out. Yep. And, and that's what I think came to pass. Anyway, what's the next one, guys? Well, you know, Dave, we're, we're going a long time here. So um, <laughs> I know it's, it's, I know we're taking up a lot of your time, but let's get a, a couple more if we could. Sure. Absolutely. Okay, so we can uh, do it again. You know, we'll come, yeah, we'll come if, back. Yeah, when the book's oh, out, like, I really want to, do one when the book comes out, guys. We'll have a Absolutely. Lot to, to, to yep. We'll have a lot more to talk about then, trust me. Because <laughs> I, I still got a lot of questions we're not gonna be able to get to. I mean, there's just too many, but um I, I do have uh, at least two more, Dave, that I I'd like to, to ask you because oh. I think these are pretty good. Um Go this one's from Marty Kane. Um he says, aside from the government agencies, um, do you think any powerful individuals outside of gov with government ties? might have been involved in Lenin's assassination due to his activism and influence. Yes. <laughs> Very yes. interesting. Yes, 100%, 100%. Do you want Absolutely. a name or do you want to save that for the book? I'll, I'll save it for the book. But what, okay. what I will say is, again, bear this in mind. He was anti-war, he was anti-religion, and he was right. anti-capitalism. Okay? So think about the people who wouldn't have appreciated that. Well, I could take a one I mean, right I'm, off the top of my head, and that would be David <laughs> Rockefeller. I mean, <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, there's this. It's just this is a nexus of people. I mean, I, I, I certainly didn't have any evidence that Rockefeller was involved, right. but there's, there's, there's a nexus. I mean, no, no, of course. So we, we, he could be. Who knows? There's no, nothing tying like him to to Kennedy either. But I mean, you know, uh, you put two and two together. I mean, nobody profited more from that assassination than David Rockefeller. I mean, that's very good point. Honest. Yeah, very good point. You know, but very you, good point. you can't yeah, prove yeah. anything. No, and we never will no. with that kind of level of influence, influential no, people. No. But well, what I will say is, it, it's it. In fact, you know, I wouldn't say it was official government actors at all. I, right. I think some of them probably gave the nod, and I think maybe someone like Nixon probably said, "Would anyone, you know, get rid of this guy who made my life a nightmare five years ago?" Right. Well, you know, I, 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 I mean, Dave, when you think about it, I mean, we we've talked about this a million times on the show. We always our our main suspect that we've linked and narrowed in on the, the Kennedy assassination is Alan Dulles. And technically, he was outside of the government at the yeah. time because Kennedy had fired him. So he had no. These guys, it's a good point, Sean. These guys carry grudges. Right. These guys, Absolutely. these guys are not these. These are, you know, these guys are not a, a kind of hair trigger, impulsive take him out. I, I've, I've been, you know, he took, he sacked me tonight. I want him dead by tomorrow. That's not how right. it works. You know, you wait for the right time. And someone like Mark Chapman, there's, I'll, I'll give you a little clue here. There's, there was a very interesting uh, conversation that I, uh, I think it was a commander in Navy intelligence had in the mid seventies with a Sunday times reporter. Uh, and he was basically talking about sleeper cell Manchurian candidates. But see, Navy intelligence gets a real easy pass here. Everyone talks about the CIA because obviously it was their documentation that came up in the church committee in the mid seventies, right. and it was their it was their accounts so that they didn't shred properly that that revealed MK Ultra. But Navy intelligence has always been associated with MK Ultra, and of course, no one has ever taken them to task. So right, they didn't get that. So if anyone's going to continue MK Ultra sleeper assassins. Navy intelligence get a free pass. No one even knows they're you know, pretty much associated with it, but they were. And right. th this commander, I forget the guy's name now, but it's all in the book. Um, you know, he came out in the mid '70s and said, oh, "Of course, we've got all over the world. You know, sleeper hypnotized assassins just ready to go, just ready to be activated." Now, if you can get away with that, if you can do that, 
you could just have a Mark Chapman, John Hinckley, maybe Lee Harvey Oswald, who knows? Maybe Jack Ruby, I don't know. You could have anyone just sort of doing a mundane life, just waiting to be activated, waiting to be triggered. It's very simple, very easy. Of course, when this came out in the Sunday Times, what this, uh, it was at a NATO conference, I believe in Norway, when it came out in the Sunday Times, obviously the Navy intelligence said, oh, I was talking hypothetically. But if you actually look at the interview this guy gave, it was very detailed. He was talking about the embassies that these people were in. He was talking about when it was done. So I think someone like Mark Chapman was activated when he was 15. I think that's when the programming started from my research. And I think for 10 years, he was moved around like a pawn. He went across the world, he went to Hawaii, he went to various psychiatrists, he went to various hypnotists. And I think he was just sitting, waiting, primed, ready to go. And I'm pretty certain he was activated August slash up September in Hawaii, 1979. I think capturing the Rye was used as a trigger device. And I think they did a dry run, as these things always do. Well, we know they did a dry run, late October, early November. Didn't quite work. Something went wrong in the programming. I think when he came back, I think they bolstered him up, possibly used more drugs, because we know he had a lot of unidentified drugs in his hotel room, which has been concealed by the NYPD and the DA's office. Uh, and he was ready to go second time, and he pulled it off the second time. Or, or he was in place, let's say, for the second time, where he was ready to um, believe he was doing something that we know he couldn't possibly do. So it, I, I think it, what I'm trying to say here in a very long-winded way is it's, it's a long game. I think with with Manchurian candidates, and I think Lisa Pease did said something great. It's right. they're not there; they're not Manchurian candidate assassins. They're Manchurian candidate patsies. Right. They're not. They're not there to kill anyone. They're there to think they're killing someone to take the can, and and that's a lot easier to pull off. And, and of uh, course, Dave, we know we know Oswald's links to the agency goes back to to way before the Kennedy assassination, back to like 1959. They were controlling his file, so obviously. You know, there there was no thought of an assassination against Kennedy then. Oswald was being used for other things. You know, we know he was involved in in anti Castro stuff and in disguising himself as a communist, and he he really wasn't a true communist. So, you know, they use these guys. You know, and then like you said, they activate them when they're needed. You yeah, know, but one not, of the things. Yeah, Go ahead. Chapman. I don't. I don't think it's, it's a slam dunk that Chapman was completely innocent here. By the way, I, I think Chapman very much like Oswald thought he was involved in something that was kind of secretive and exciting, and sure. he was kind of you know you know helping people out to do this, that, and the other. I, I'm, I'm almost I'm certain of that. But it did no way did he think when he was, you know, the, the night, the day of the murder, the afternoon of the murder, guys. He's not acting like a guy who's sweating and getting ready to do something that's going to be really seismic and you know which it was. He's 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 taking two girls out to lunch. He's taking them out to lunch and he's talking about Hawaii and his wife and his his upbringing and they think he's charming. And and the so-called Beatles obsessive guys, I'll give you a little exclusive here. We were always told he was obsessed about John Lennon, obsessed about the Beatles. He didn't even have double fantasy at the time. He's like, it was out for quite a few weeks at that point. He had the single back home, but he never even bought the album. And it was the girls, it was Jude, Jude and Jerry, the two, you know, the two uh, fans that were always outside of Dakota, who suggested to Mark, why don't you go and get the album and get John to sign it? And he's like, yeah, that's a good idea. I think I'll do that. Yeah, yeah. I've, you know, I've always... And, and apparently he knew nothing about the Beatles. He didn't have a clue. They said his oh. knowledge of the Beatles was just, it wasn't there. He had no idea about them. But this is a, apparently, a, a, you know, Beatles obsessive. So right up until the point when he was triggered, he's just some kind of fan who's excited right. to get an autograph or just, you know, excited to take two girls out to lunch. And he's kind of, I, I just think, you know, he was completely controlled up until the point where, the, 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 as, as Dorothy Lewis, the, the psychiatrist, psychiatrist who saw him independently, and so her, her kind of assessment is very important. I, I think he was just ready to be, you know, he was ready to act out a command hallucination, as she called it. And he was commanded under hallucination to do something or to think he was doing something. And obviously, Padermo's in the frame for that because he was the guy standing next to him. Of course, there could have been other people there. We don't know. Anyone could have done it. So it's um, it's very interesting. It's very interesting. And, and, and I, I, I've sort of forgot how we got to this point now. But I think what I'm trying to say is, guys, th these are long-winded well thought out operations. And I right. think someone like Mark Chapman, he's just picked off a shelf, to be honest. 
Yeah, to and, do a and job. Dave, the one thing you said about grudges, uh, interesting, is uh, you know I had a conversation with Lisa Pease, and and uh, one of our podcasts, I said that I, I believe the seeds of the the assassination um, in, in the John F. Kennedy, the conspiracy, it, it came right after the the Cuban Missile Crisis when the hardliners decided this guy is a danger now, and he's a mm-hmm. threat to what you know we want to do with the Soviet Union. And Lisa Pease said. I think it goes beyond that. It goes back earlier than that, and it goes back to when Dulles fired Kennedy. I think that's when the first seed probably was planted in Dulles's, you know, Dulles's mind. You know, I'm going to get this guy back. And and looking back at it, I I tend to agree with her now. You know, I think you know, I think the hardliners were brought in later, but I think Dulles at that point, I think you know, he did have that, you know, where I'm going to I'm going to get this guy eventually. These are dark actors, Sean. You know, these, these, I think everyone's dark. sort of. Sure. Everyone thinks these guys kind of they, they do it in some kind of scientific chart way where it's kind of like, you know, everything is done to the nth degree and it's it's perfect. And it, it could just be, do you know what? I, I've got nefarious sleeper cell Manchurian candidate assets. I've got people who handle these assets. Uh, I know someone like Richard Nixon who d- despises this guy. I know someone like Ronald Reagan who works in his administration or is going to work in his administration, perhaps. Who is you know is well aware that this guy is going to be a fierce critic of the administration. I've got other nefarious people who dislike John for other reasons, which I think I'll reveal in my book. And you know they all come together and go, do you know what? Let's just let's just put it on. Let's just do it because you you, you need various elements here, guys. It's not easy. You, sure. Obviously, Chapman is one element. Chapman's the patsy element, okay? right? And that's important. And they're they're you know a sleeper Manchurian can be a sleeper Manchurian all his life and do nothing nefarious. I'm certain there's many people who went through the program and just were never used and wouldn't know that they were ready to be used. You've also right. got to have the, the assassin, okay? So, you know, you've got to have the guy behind the grassy knoll. You've got to have the guy standing behind the RFK. You've got to have the guy who took sure. Martin Luther King from a hell of a long way away. And you've got to have the guy placed at Dakota ready to do his business. And as Dr. Halloran said, shoot John with a tight professional grouping above his heart, okay? It was a professional hit. So you've got to have that. That's the second thing you've got to have. Then you've got to have elements in the NYPD who don't do their job properly and clean up and go in there and take things like spent bullets away and make sure they're never seen again. That definitely happened. And, and, and then you know, you've got they, other elements got, in the media. You got, absolutely. And you got different people handling the assassins and you got different people handling the patsies and, and you know, those things could be, you know, and the clean up. yeah, exactly. The clean up. So, yeah. You got different parts of the operation and, and these things are really complex. And, um, and they can all be, they can all be siloed. They don't all yeah. have to be, you know, you know, Dr. No in a bunker. Right. You know, they absolutely. can be siloed out and they yes. may not even know of each other's existence no, or, or absolutely purpose. Absolutely not. You know, so I think that's how the, I, I'm certain that's how all these famous assassinations have gone down. Right. And, and of course, it's, it's, it's much easier that way not to have a trail back to a, sure. one singular entity. Anyway, sorry. Yeah, your final sure. question. Sure. Well, yeah, let's just, you know, I got one more, Dave, and then, you know, if the answer's too long, we could save it for next time, but I think okay. it's an important one, but yeah, because I know we're going on like two hours here, Dave, but this is Oh, you're great. joking. Is that how long it's been now? Oh, I think God. it is, right, I Dave, Billy? Oh, God. Yeah, yeah I mean, we're, this is... Yeah, no. I mean, and Dave, just to tell you, you know, we still haven't gotten to all the questions. That's how many we got. Oh, we'll do it again. We'll do it again incredible. when the book comes out. We'll do it again okay. when the book comes out. All right. Excellent. Well, last one. This is from uh, Seamus in South Africa. Um, Okay. Mr. Dave Whelan, uh, can you discuss the cop Dana who befriended Chapman and a Chicago trip? It always seems like a key city in these plots seems to be Chicago. And I I can attest to that. Chicago always seems to come up. uh, Mm -hmm. We know the prior plot to kill Kennedy. One of them was in Chicago and, and, you know, guys like uh, Robert Mayhew got ties to Chicago and stuff like that. So Chicago is a, is a, always a key plot. But do you want to talk about Dana? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Dana, what a fascinating character. So so Dana Reeves turns up in the Mark Chapman story when Mark is 16 years old, okay? Uh, at this point, Mark is a, uh, he's what's called a Jesus freak. You know, you remember that, guys, that that, that thing that happened in the, in the 70s in America right. where mm-hmm. – everybody sort of fused the hippie movement with, with the new kind of Christian movement and everyone kind of walked around getting high on Jesus and not high on drugs. So Mark, Mark kind of got into that in a big way. Um, so he was at that point, 16, he was kind of pissed. Sorry, no one swore there. He was, uh, Mark was annoying. I'll, I'll let you edit that one out guys. Mark was annoying his friends with his kind of evangelical, you need to, you know, 
uh, come to Christ. And he was kind of basically just preaching 24-7. The thing about Mark is he had one of those kind of personalities where he got into something. That was it. He was all in, Mark. You know, he kind of, he couldn't stop himself. Uh, he, He was very suggestible. And once he was into something, boy, was he into it. So he got really into that. And he was getting to the point where he was becoming quite boring to a lot of his friends who used to take drugs with Mark and go to rock concerts with Mark and do all those kind of things that other teenagers were doing that weren't into Jesus. Um, so at that point, Dana turns up. And we think he's probably at that point at least three, possibly four years older than Mark. So he's an older guy. He's not into Jesus at all. He's into guns. Uh, by most people's account, he's the kind of rough Rambo type guy who kind of, you know, very... <sighs> kind of menacing literally everyone I've spoken to who remembers him or no one really knows him but they just kind of recall him and they all kind of say yeah really dark dangerous guy we don't know quite what Mark saw in him but you know Mark really looked up to him Mark idolized him and for some reason Dana decides at this point to bring this 16 year old Jesus freak into his life to the point where he gave him a room in his house and he starts to sort of stay with Mark and he starts to kind of get into he starts to stay with Dana sorry and he starts to get into things that Dana are into which is guns and shooting and and driving fast and all this kind of stuff while he's into this kind of Jesus phase so it kind of you kind of have to ask yourself what did Dana see in Mark but what did Mark see in Dana just absolutely absolutely bizarre relationship um so Mark goes off and he does his stuff with the YMCA does his stuff at the Vietnamese refugee camp to the point, and this is this is a great indication of what influence Dana had on Mark. He he drove when when the Vietnamese refugee camp was closing down in 1975, might be 1976 actually. Dana drives all the way, I think it's a 1,300 mile drive out to pick up Mark, collect him from the camp, and drive him back to Atlanta. And when he gets to the camp, people notice a complete change in Mark Chapman to the point where Dana has complete control over Mark. Mark does whatever Dana says. He, he listens attentively to Dana. They kind of play with Dana's gun. Dana gets his gun out and Mark's kind of totally, a complete personality change playing with, with um, Dana's gun. To the point where Dana's kind of got almost complete control over Mark. Um, so Mark then, what happens then is Dana gets Mark some jobs in security. There is a, there is a Chicago element. One of Mark's friends, would you believe, uh, goes out to Chicago and they try to do a kind of Christian comedy act, would you believe, in Chicago? Doesn't go wow. very well. Yeah, uh, doesn't go very well, these Christian comedians. And, and Mark comes back to Atlanta. He always, whenever something didn't go right, he broke up with a girlfriend or the refugee camp ends or the comedy act doesn't work. He always went back to Dana. Dana's the kind of base that Mark kind of hung around in. And at that point, um, Dana got Mark a job in security, a security guard in a hospital that Dana used to work in. And then Dana becomes a police officer. And after he becomes a police officer, he gets Mark a armed security job. So Mark's starting to get very familiar with guns. He starts to go on sort of gun rifle range kind of stuff. And he's, he's kind of very much under Dana's spell. But then in 1977, completely out of the blue, Mark goes to Hawaii. Okay. And Dana sort of says at the time, Dana's on record as kind of saying, well, I don't quite know why he did it, but he kind of just went, he got up and left and flew off to Hawaii to do whatever he did there. Dana then comes back into the story when I told you about that first abortive mission to, to, to kill John, late October, early November. Mark goes out there with a gun that he's bought. And he, Mark tried to buy some bullets in New York, but you can't buy bullets in New York unless you're a resident of New York, which Mark couldn't prove because his driving license said Hawaii was where he was living at the time. So he rings up. The legend is that he rang up Dana and says, I'm coming down to see you. So he fly again, money, no problem. OK, so he's flown over to New York, can't get bullets to kill John Lennon flies down to Atlanta and says to Dana, this is the kind of official narrative, uh, Dana, I'm in New York. I'm a little bit worried about the muggers there. Um, sorry to sort of throw this on you. You weren't expecting this, um, but can you give me some bullets so I can protect myself from muggers? And Dana gives Mark some hollow bullets. We know one of those bullets wasn't hollow, found in John Lennon, but let's go with it. Dana gives him hollow bullets. And even takes Mark out into the woods to do some target practice 
with these hollow bullets because obviously if you shoot a mugger in New York, you're going to want to make sure you hit him properly. So Dana takes Mark out into the woods to do some target practice. Mark goes back to New York and for some reason the mission is aborted and he goes back to Gloria, shows Gloria with gun and bullets. And that's, that's another story of why Gloria Chapman wasn't taken as an accessory for murder, but we'll go into that another time. But basically what happens then is when the murder happens, Mark is suddenly well known. Dana Reeves is investigated and Dana says, I don't really want to talk about it for obvious reasons. And then any journalist who tries to approach Dana, he was obviously someone who just really didn't want to talk about it because obviously he doesn't want to be an accessory to murder. But Dana's story was, yeah, Mark sort of took me by surprise turned up at my door, said he was in New York, said he was going back to New York, was scared of that mug as I gave him some bullets. I shouldn't have done. I'm sort of sad that I did. And, you know, I didn't have a clue what he was doing. But what I've discovered is when Mark was in New York, late October, early November, a day before he went to see Dana, he rang him twice at his sheriff's office. Two phone calls were recorded from his hotel. And I think what Dana, what Mark was doing there was he was telling Dana all about why he needed those bullets. And I think Dana Reeves knew exactly why Mark was coming to see him. It wasn't a surprise visit. Mark must have told him what, what he was doing and where he was. I am in New York. And I don't believe Mark sort of said, I'm coming down to see you. And then sprung that I need bullets on you when he turns up at Dana's door. I think they were talking about that on the phone. I can't prove it. But I think that's what happened there. And then we next hear about Dana Reeves. Uh, after the assassination, um, a few years ago now, he was thrown out of the uh, Atlanta police force. I think he's still in jail for child molestation offences. Wow. So that's the end of Dana Reeves for now. But I think if anybody can sit down with Dana in the future, and I hope someone does, I certainly can't get to him, but I hope someone does. I think Dana's got an awful lot of things to say about his relationship with Mark Chapman, how that relationship started, why it started, what's the truth about the hollow bullets? And, um, you, know, what, what, you know, what on earth was your friendship with Mark Chapman all about? So he's a very interesting character in the Mark Chapman story. Wow. And uh, there's, there's a lot more stuff to come from Ben. Wow. <laughs> you can't you can't make it up can you guys you no that's that's for sure that's for sure yeah. yeah truth is stranger than fiction for sure yeah uh, yeah yeah uh david this is again another amazing appearance and and we we really appreciate it we spent we spent a lot of time with you today and uh just appreciate you coming on and answering all these questions and of course we have so many more that that we need you to answer and we'll have you back for the you know for the for the book uh release sure. and um you know eventually the documentary um i mean we can't thank you enough this is uh, you know fantastic stuff and sean i know you you agree yeah thank you dave this is this has been great i mean yeah. just fantastic and and the feedback is just and i'm sure after this we're, we're gonna get more questions dave so i'm sure we'll right. just add right. it to the list yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Well, if anyone wants to read up more about it before the book comes out, please just go to my Substack, davidwhelan.substack. Uh, there's a YouTube channel, uh, Instagram channel, Assassination of Lennon. Go on there. You can find some more stuff, some more information. And there's a, a Twitter account, Lennon Murder. Come and come and follow me on there. And uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to getting the book out, guys. Thank you for allowing me to highlight my work on your show. I love Thank what you. you guys do. And uh, I'm sure we'll be talking again very soon. Okay. Absolutely. Tremendous, Guarantee Thank it. You. Thank you, David. All right. Thanks, All right. David Whelan, we appreciate it. And uh, that's enough out of you. Good night, everybody. That's Enough Out of You podcast is executive produced and written by Bill Rader and Sean Kane and edited by Bill Rader. The That's Enough Out of You podcast and logo are exclusive property of Bags of Chicken, LLC. Any rebroadcast, retransmission, or accounts of this podcast without the express written consent of Bags of Chicken, LLC, is prohibited. So don't even try it.